Hello everyone. Thanks very much for the opportunity to chat with you today. I'm going to talk a little about the topic of violence, violence prevention, aggression and bullying. Some lessons learned, some knowledge gained. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that the land we meet on today is the traditional lands for the Kaurna people. I respect their spiritual relationship with their country. I also acknowledge the Kaurna people as the traditional custodians of Adelaide region and their cultural and heritage beliefs are still as important to the living Kaurna people today. In the presentation today, I'm going to cover the issues associated with violence, violence prevention. I'm going to look at matters of definition. I'm going to look at program development. I'm going to focus a little on what it is that we can do in the context of our centre or our classroom or our school to address this particular issue. What have we learned? Where do we want to go with this? I'd like to acknowledge certainly in these uh, particularly challenging times the fact that the uh, Inclusive Expo is going ahead in the way that it is. I think this is testimony to the organisers. I think this is testimony to you and your schools and your classrooms at the moment and the work that you're doing with the kids in the context of the schools. There is no doubt that we do have some significant knowledge associated with violence and violence prevention, as illustrated in this particular cartoon. But Mark Twain captured some of this when he argued in, in his writing, our ancestors have bred pugnacity into our bones and marrow, and thousands of years of peace won't breed it out. You might like to stop and have a think about whether or not you actually would subscribe to that particular view of Mark Twain. I'm going to revisit that particular quote at the end today. But to get there, one of the things that has intrigued me over the years is how do we bring about change in our classrooms, in our schools and our communities? Malcolm Gladwell is a writer that has looked at this particular topic. He's argued strongly that there are three simple principles. First of these, the law of the few. There don't have to be many of you. You're the ones that at the moment are comprise the, the few that will make the difference. Secondly, he's argued that the message that you have to get out there about violence prevention, bullying prevention, is a sticky message. It needs to stick. It needs people to be attracted to it. It needs people to think about it. Finally, the power of the context. This is the right moment, according to Gladwell. The fact that you are part of this expo and that you're on board around this issue, around violence prevention and bullying prevention, that says that this is, context is right. It is the right moment now to bring about change in our classrooms and in our schools and our communities. We've also found that an important aspect to add to these three principles is a champion. And I'd argue strongly that you're the champion. Champions occur in many different forms in our school. It could be the teacher, the principal, the deputy, could be the grounds person, it could be the librarian, it could be the cafeteria person. It could be a student within the school. A champion is somebody who decides that they are going to do about something about what is happening. So let's look at this particular issue of definition. How do violence and aggression and bullying differ from one another? Now, Peter Smith, a, a United Kingdom researcher who's a champion in this particular area, has argued strongly that violence has to be understood within a context. It's the context of the school, it's the context of the classroom, it's the context of the community, it's the context of our society. Unless we're looking at violence in, in that particular context, then we're not able to effectively address it. Now, violence is any aggressive act of, that brings about particular uh, forms of extreme physical harm that result in death or injury. That's the simple definition. There are a number of predictors of violence. Poor parental supervision, physical punishment in childhood predicts convictions for violence in adulthood, and bullying is associated with violence. Now, violence rates are associated with under academically performing schools, high dropout rates, economically underfunded schools, high teacher turnover, high community gang activity, and schools that lack a strong mission statement. Now, media reports, as you would be aware of, often draw attention to the issue of school violence. Here's one report I found 
from the Sydney Morning Herald. Knives, guns, threats. Violence at school spins out of control. The question that we raise in the context of today's presentation is, is it out of control? Do you think it's out of control? What could be done of, about it if you did have that kind of belief? Where would you make a start? Now we know that Australian schools generally, in terms of crime rates, that those particular crime rates and property damage rates have remained consistently stable during the 2000s. It's unlikely that school-related violence has increased as well. And if we look at other countries like Canada, those have also recorded similar drops in violence and property damage. But interestingly, not unlike the Australian situation, the public in Canada believes that violence is on the increase. And in particular, adolescent girls' violent behaviour is, to quote, out of control. We move from the issue of violence then to that of aggression. I'd like to read from you from a favourite book of mine. You can't believe how glad I am to see you again, you dear old thing, said the Duchess as she tucked her arm affectionately into Alice's and they walked off together. Alice was very glad to find her in such a pleasant temper and thought to herself that perhaps it was only the pepper that had made her so savage when they had met in the kitchen. We understand that defining aggression generally focused initially on physical harm but now we understand that there are different forms of aggression. There's proactive aggression, there's predatory aggression, and there's sexual aggression. Grace Skrepik, a colleague of mine, has studied in particular the issue of whether aggression and harm go together. Does all aggression cause, cause harm, or can there be aggression without harm? This might be a, a, a topic that you stop and have a little bit of a think about in terms of whether all aggression is harmful. Grace has found in a study of 20 countries that in fact students report that not all aggression is harmful. I want to now move quickly to that issue of school bullying. And here are some drawings associated uh, with students' lived experiences of physical bullying, social bullying and cyber bullying. I've collected these over the years and students have provided them to me. I think they provide a useful insight into students' lives and students' worlds. Now the issue of school uh, bullying and its definition is a really significant one because bullying is different from aggression and is different from violence. It involves repetition, it involves a negative action that brings about harm, it occurs over time, and it's generally something that the young person doesn't feel that they can protect themselves from. Now we know that uh, there are some important research findings that are emerging out of Flinders University and, the, and my research colleagues uh, in this particular field. If a child reports that they have been bullied in primary school, there's over a 50% chance that they will be bullied in secondary school. New and emergent bullies occur at any time during secondary school. Being a victim of bullying can occur at any time. It's not just years eight and nine that can occur up to year 12. Interestingly, students, when we talk to them in, in a separate study, rated face-to-face -face bullying as the most harmful. But when we assess the harm as associated with anxiety and depression for those students, we found that the students who had experienced cyberbullying actually had higher levels, elevated levels of anxiety and depression. Now, experts will advise students, look, if you're being bullied, you should talk to somebody about it. Now, we talk to people about it. We talk to young people who had experienced bullying and we ask them this question. They told us the last thing they would do if they were being seriously bullied would be to talk about it. It might be embarrassment. It might be the fact that they don't feel they can do anything about it. It might be the fear that if they did mention it, they in turn would be subject to it. We know that seriously bullied students use non-productive coping strategies. They stay away from school, they use drugs, they do things to deny that it's actually happening to them. Students do not develop better coping strategies as they get older. We need to be very clear about this as teachers. But there's an economic cost, and I want to draw this to your attention. 
We've talked about the physical, the social and the psychological costs of bullying. And you would be aware of the, as aware of these issues and the costs associated with bullying as I am. But there's an economic cost. And this economic cost would indicate very clearly that up to half a billion dollars worth of costs per year in Australia are down to bullying. These costs arise because young people and their families go and see their local GP. Some of them are on medication. Some of them don't go to school. Some of them engage in school refusal, want to be schooled at home. There is an economic cost to school bullying. But there's also a collateral cost. This isn't only about children and young people who are victims, who are bullies, and maybe bystanders. We know very clearly now from the research that is emerging there, that the collateral costs impact on all students' academic achievement within a school environment. Bullying in a school impacts the academic performance of all students. So violence and aggression and bullying. I've provided here a short YouTube clip, two to three minutes. You might want to stop and have a look at this. Uh, you might want to have a chat with some friends and colleagues about what you saw on that particular YouTube clip, whether it could be stopped, how was the young person affected, what could be done about it. Now we also are very clear that physiologically there is an impact associated with being bullied. There are these things called telomeres. Telomeres are part of the chromosomes. And telomere erosion generally occurs as we get older. My telomeres, by virtue of my age, are a heck of a lot shorter than yours are. But we know that young people, from the research that have been done, young people who are exposed to domestic violence, violence in the community, and bullying, have shorter telomeres than those who have not. So there is a physiological aspect associated with being bullied that we should be aware of. Now we know through the research that we've done at Flinders that there are certain programs that are very good and there are some programs that are not so good and do not have the evidence to support them. I put up here a list of uh, points associated with programs where it's very clear that these factors associated with programs that do not work. They fail to address strong risk factors. They're developmentally inappropriate. They aggregate or put young people who are at risk together. They have poor implementation protocols. Teachers just don't know, what am I going to be doing in this program? What should I be doing in this lesson? They have staff running these programs who do not receive sufficient professional development to enable them to deliver these programs with efficacy. Zero tolerance and scare tactics don't work. It's just not worth the effort. There is some good news. There are programs that do work. These have got strong and good and sound theoretical rationales. They address strong risk factors because there are young people who are particularly at risk in our community and in our schools. They work intensively over a period of time as programs. There's no quick fix there's no shortcuts in terms of reducing bullying and violence and aggression. We're in it for the long haul. That's the important message to get across from programs that do work. So you might want to stop and have a think about these. You might want to add from your own lived experience some points that you think, oh, well, this is what really made this program work in my classroom. This is what really made this program work in my school. There's a really interesting Canadian researcher that I'd refer you to, Tremblay. He's got a series of points here that I put up that might give you and uh, colleagues an opportunity to stop and think about. I'll illustrate it with the first point. Tremblay has argued that humans do not learn to aggress. They learn not to aggress. What's the implication of that for us in our classrooms and in our schools and our centres? What should that direct us to do around working with children and young people?
And I've given you a range of other points based on Tremblay's research that might give us also pause for thought. We don't have to agree. I certainly don't agree with all those points. I would have a different view about some of them. And I'm sure from your experience in your classroom and centre and working with young people that you should be able to disagree with those points that Tremblay has made. Now we understand from the research that's being done very clearly that in the Australian context, children are safer in our schools than out of them. And we should take a lot of credit. You should take a lot of credit for that. You're creating a sound and clear and safe classroom environment and space for young people to be. And I've just put a couple of points up there that you might want to read through in some more detail and have a little bit of a think about. It's very clear, for example, though, that where bullying and violence and aggression occurs in our schools, it often occurs, and that's what young people tell us, out of sight of teachers. Now, it can occur in terms of cyberbullying on the weekend, and then it gets brought into our classrooms and schools. It might occur in the gym or the corridors or the toilet blocks. And these are really difficult to police and understand that we can do something around that. So we need to think creatively as teachers, how are we going to address this issue that bullying and violence and aggression, where it occurs, often occurs out of our sight. What will we do? What will we put in place? Now we've talked so far about the fact that children and young people are subject to this bullying and aggression and violence. They're not the only ones. Australian research is very clear that school principals and teachers are also subject to bullying and violence and aggression. We understand from the research that's been collected in the last couple of years that principals and teachers are subject to this. The violence, as Peter Smith indicated earlier, should be contextualised in the context of our community and our society. And schools are part of that society and that community. And violence comes from without into our classrooms and into our schools. It threatens us, it threatens teachers, it threatens principals, so that they feel unsafe in their learning environment. And after all, it's very clear that a clear mission statement for our education is that schools should be a safe learning environment. Just to illustrate this issue of the fact that violence, aggression and bullying impacts us all, here's some figures that I've provided for you from the Department for Education from Western Australia from 2014 through to 2017. The trend is very clear. Violence against teachers and principals has increased over this period of time. UNESCO gives us some fairly practical, short suggestions about what we should be doing and what we can be doing in our classrooms and schools to address the issue of stopping violence. Generally, the points emphasise adopting a holistic approach, engaging everybody, student voice being really significant in all of this, building on student resilience, giving them the coping skills that give them the confidence to know that they can do something about this issue for themselves. Provide a safe and welcoming place for students, for parents and for teachers. And teaching in very clear and concise and practical ways some skills that enable a young person to stand up and say, stop it, I actually don't like that. We need to be able to provide them with those kind of skills. You might like to discuss what it is that you can do in your centre or your school to help create this safe learning environment for all. You would know this better than I do. This simple format for assess, plan, do and review. So you might like to collect some information about your current programs and policy that are in place. You might like to plan what can be done and how they can be changed and altered. You might to, like to engage student voice to get them to review this, these programs and these policies, get teachers' views, get parents' views. You would then enact it, do it and get some feedback on it and review it. 
And this has to be a kind of cycle that you go through um, in your school or in your centre to have an up-to-date policy and a set of programs and practice that create that safe learning environment. I'd really like to draw your attention to a, a significant South Australian Department for Education initiative, the new policy around school bullying. I've given you a link on this slide to that particular policy. The really interesting and important thing about this policy is it emphasises that violence is not simply associated with a classroom or school. Violence occurs in the broader context of the community and all stakeholders have a significant investment in putting an end to violence, putting an end to aggression and putting an end to bullying. So you might like to have a look at the new Department for Education anti-bullying policy. And I strongly believe that this Expo on Inclusive Education is such a significant one. The workshops that will follow and that come along with this will provide you with some very practical ways to address and look at enacting this new departmental policy. Because it emphasises that it's not just a teacher problem, a school problem, it is a community issue. And that's where I refer you back to Malcolm Gladwell's three principles for enacting change again. It needs to be a community-based perspective that we as a school or a centre will take on board to address this issue of violence and bullying. Now, out of all of this to begin to finish with, there are some lessons learnt and some knowledge gained. One of the key elements that I am committed very strongly to is student voice. Student voice is a key to developing effective policy practice and programs in our classrooms and in our schools. And if we don't have buy-in from them, if we don't have buy-in from the students and the parents, then that program or that policy or that practice is less effective for that. There are reasons for partnerships. They are particularly advantageous for our schools, particularly in socioeconomically depressed areas. Schools alone often lack the resources or the capacity and out there in the community, there are enormous resources that can come into the schools that will enrich the classroom and enrich the school community generally around addressing this particular issue. And that's where the departmental policy is really significant. It's a, an Australia first in this context. South Australia is leading the way into developing this community-based approach involving parents, families, communities. In a and alongside working with schools and with teachers. So I'd urge you to have a look at that departmental policy, maybe have a chat in your staff room around it and what aspects of it that you can look at um, developing and enlarging upon. So there are some lessons learned. We are charged in our schools and our classrooms with providing the safe learning environment. We should distinguish between school violence and violence in schools. We should emphasise very strongly that Australia as a nation is leading the way and has led the way since 2003, then called the National Safe Schools Framework. No other country in the world had such a significant framework to provide resources and skills and knowledge about preventing bullying and violence and aggression. Now it's gone through a number of iterations and if you have a look at the Student Wellbeing Hub, you'll find the latest iteration developed in 2017. Schools are part of the community. Relationships are, are key to violence prevention. There are practical alternatives to negative zero tolerance strategies. We need to think very carefully about how do we inculcate a sense of caring, kindness, and justice in the context of developing policy and programs. We need to think about programs that are multi-focused, that are multi-dimensional, that involve all stakeholders. And we need to look at evidence base, quality assurance. Are we giving our students, our teachers, our parents, the best policy programs, the best policy kind of programs and practice that we can? Let's revisit Mark Twain, the story so far. I'm really interested in the opportunity for you to have a think about 
his statement that our ancestors have bred pugnacity into our bones and marrow and thousands of years of peace won't breed it out. You might want to have a, a chat with some colleagues around your beliefs around that statement that Mark Twain made. So for school policy, if you're selling real estate, it's position, position, position. If you're selling a safe learning environment at school, it's about relationships, relationships and relationships. School and classroom climate matter. That's an important part. I'd like to leave you with a postscript from our feathered friends. Now, according to Charles Darwin and evolutionary theory, it really doesn't pay us to be kind to others. It really doesn't pay us to help others out. It really doesn't pay us to engage in acts of kindness, particularly where this is at risk to ourselves. Students will tell us the reason that I don't step in, the reason there's a bystander effect is that if I say something, if I do something, it might be me that is subject to the bullying. So there's a sound basis for evolutionary theory and Charles Darwin's notion. But then we pick up on the African grey parrot. And let me just take you there. This African gay parrot happily helps each other out to acquire treats without any assumption or anticipation that their altruism will be reciprocated. They voluntarily and spontaneously help familiar parrots to achieve a goal without any obvious immediate benefit to themselves. But there's more. The African grey parrot take this a step further. Unlike primates, for example, the parrots do not display any anger or envy if one of their friends receives some favourable treatment or a treat. Instead, they seem to be quite content that good things are happening to their buddy. Lessons learned and knowledge gained. Do you want to be my friend? Okay. It's about as simple as that, and it's about as complex as that. I've given you some references that you might like to follow up. You're also welcome to contact me um, as part of um, this particular expo. And I would strongly support the fact that the organisers of this expo have gone ahead to present this expo, the workshops that are coming that will provide you with opportunity to talk about making a difference in your school, in your classroom and community. Thank you.